So I'm sure. very, I am very glad that we can hear you. So Raphael Hager, Kiel University with very strange name. And uh, you will speak about compact couplets and handful operators on the true polyanalytic Fox space. Please, Raphael. Okay, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to your seminar. So today I will be extending on my talk I gave recently uh, at a vote in Croco, but in case you haven't been there, it's no problem. Um, don't worry, I'll, everything will be self-contained. Also, if you have been there, um, I will also um, give some additional results, so don't run away. Now, uh, let me first talk about polyanalytic uh, functions. So polyanalytic functions are, whoops, sorry. No, okay, fine. Um, polyanalytic functions are smooth functions on a complex plane, such as the nth conjugate derivative of the function vanishes. So I'm thinking of f here as a function in z and z bar, and then I take the nth derivative with respect to the second coordinate, and if this is zero, I call, zero, I call it polyanalytic. So in particular, if you have n equals one, these will just give you the usual analytic functions on, on the complex plane, or you may call them entire functions. Alternatively, you can also think of them as polynomials in Z bar with coefficients in the holomorphic functions. Okay, and then the degree of this polynomial plus one is then called the polyanalytic order of your polyanalytic function. Okay, so in terms of regularity, polyanalytic functions are somewhere in between real analytic and complex analytic functions. So they share some properties with complex analytic functions, but not all of them. Okay, so let's, let's have an example. Uh, let's consider this function, one minus mod c squared. So clearly this is a polyanalytic function of order two, right? If you take two conjugate derivatives, then this will be zero. Um, but this function vanishes on the unit circle, right? And also has a maximum at zero. So clearly the maximum principle is violated. And also the um, identity theorem doesn't hold, right? Because um, we vanish on the whole unit circle. So these do not hold, but we still have a weak form of the identity theorem, which of course also holds for real analytic functions that if you vanish on an open set, then you vanish entirely. And you also have like a Liouville's theorem, for example, or there's also a Cauchy type integral formula for uh, these kind of functions. So um, you always have to be a little bit careful with these functions because not everything you know from complex analysis works here. Now, let me take the usual Gaussian measure on the complex plane, normalized so that the full measure is, is one. And we take the corresponding L2 space. And in there, we take the polyanalytic functions of order at most n. Okay, and this I will be calling the polyanalytic Fox space, which is poly Fox space in short. Okay, so these are closed subspaces. In particular, they're Hilbert spaces. And we will see in a minute that these are actually reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. Again, for n equals one, you just get the standard analytic Fox space that you've probably seen a lot already in this seminar uh, somewhere. Now, because these are all Hilbert subspaces and they are all, all nested in each other, right? So F1 is just the analytic Fox space. Then you have F2, um, polyanalytic functions of order at most two, three, and so on. They're all nested in each other. So you can take um, orthogonal complements of each other. So you start with the uh, analytic Fox space and take its orthogonal complement in the, the in the F2 space, right? And, and so on, okay? And like that, you can get a, comp a decomposition of the, of the polyanalytic Fox space like, like this. So you, you define F brackets K as Fk minus Fk minus one. 
And as Nikolai showed over 20 years ago, actually, that you can write these functions always in this form with analytic function G. Okay. And now if you take all of them, take the sum of all of them, you actually get all of L2 back. Now, um, just for notation, um, in the following, I will always put brackets around the K. So it will always be bracket K when we're talking about the true polyfox spaces. These are called the true polyfox spaces. Um, always when I put brackets, I mean the, the full polyfox spaces and without brackets, it's, it's the full space we defined uh, up, up here. Okay, so just to distinguish. And then, well, if we're talking about F1, so just the usual analytic Fox space, then sometimes I will just uh, skip the, the subscript. So it will just be F2 for the standard Fox space. Okay, so that's just for, for notation. Now, since these are all uh, Hilbert subspaces, of course we have orthogonal projections. And as I told you earlier, these are all uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. So we can actually write down the projection explicitly. So they look very similar to what you know from the analytic Fox space. The only additional term is this LK minus one, right? And this, these are called the Laguerre polynomials. So the definition you can see here is just some polynomial. So L zero is just one. And then L one is one minus X uh, and so on. Rafael, Visible, so you need to you need to move forward. Sorry, uh, it's you invisible. Okay. This uh, like I uh, yeah no no move forward again forward. Okay again. What, what no, can you I, see? Uh, yeah. Sorry. No, absolutely per now absolutely per everything. Sorry, something but something is wrong now. I mean, no no you, no, sh no. you should now you should see. The polynomials now yeah exactly yeah okay so okay i don't know what what was happening okay sorry sorry <laughs> yeah some technical issues um okay so yeah these these are polynomials of degree k and we have these uh, orthogonal projections and of course if we have projections we can define tuplets operators so um let's say we have a bounded function f then we can multiply with this f and project back onto the, the Fox space to get our tuplets operators. And well, if we have tuplets operators, we can of course also define Hunkel operators in the same way. Of course, now we map to the orthogonal complement of this true polyfox space, which is take the complementary projection instead of, uh, of the projection. All right, now, when we have such operators, one of the most natural question is to ask, when is such an operator compact? Okay, and that's that's sort of the subject for today, if you've, you've seen it in the title. Um, so we want to talk about when, when are these compact? And of course, if you think of compactness in, in these kind of spaces, you think of the Berezin transform, right? So um, we have these, uh, normalized reproducing kernels as usual. So as I said, these are normal, uh, these are reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. So we have reproducing kernels. We've seen them on, on this slide here, right? You see it, you see it here. Then you can normalize them. Again, looks like in the standard Fox space case, except that you have this additional polynomial as well. And then when you have these, you can of course define the Berezin transform in the usual way, okay? And you can define this for every bounded linear operator on this true polyfox space, okay? And typically what you, what you want now is to characterize compactness in some sense with, um, with the help of this uh, barriers and transform, okay? But there is one problem here. The one problem you have immediately with, with these uh, polyanalytic functions, it's, it's the following thing that you use quite heavily um, in, in the theory to show that, well, to show that the Berezin transform is injective, right? What you use is that if you have a function of two complex variables that is analytic in the first and anti-analytic in the second variable, 
then if it vanishes on, on the diagonal, it vanishes completely. This is a property that doesn't hold anymore for polyanalytic functions. So if you have a polyanalytic function that, um, well, a, a func sorry, a function of two complex variables, um, which is polyanalytic in the first and anti-polyanalytic, by which I just mean the conjugate is polyanalytic, in the second variable, um, and it vanishes on the diagonal, this no longer means that the function is zero. And you can take a very simple example. Uh, for example, this here, this is clearly polyanalytic and anti-polyanalytic in Z and W. So, but, and vanishes on, on the diagonal, but clearly this is not a zero function. So this argument doesn't work anymore. And um, so you can't, you can't just apply the same theory because you will get stuck at, at this point. So we need to do something else. And what we do here is we compare these, um, we first compare these true polyanalytic Fox spaces. And in fact, they're all more or less the same in some sense as I will be describe. So this is, uh, these are the, uh, creation and annihilation operators. Um, they are called like that in, in physics, and that's why I put a dagger here. And um, this is just the adjoint, right? So this is a dagger is just the adjoint of a, but it's some physics notation. Um, so a is just the the conjugate derivative, and uh, a dagger is, is the um, the adjoint of that. And these um, actually actually bounded even. They are even um, iso isometric. If you put some factor in front of it, one over square root of k, then these are isometric isomorphisms between these true polyfox spaces. Okay, and they are inverse to each other in, in, in this sense. Okay, so that means these true polyfox spaces, they are all more or less the same, right? Because we can always jump via these creation and annihilation operators. Excuse me. Between, between them in particular, we can jump back to the standard Fox space, right? Which is just F1. Okay. And because of that, the, the whole L2 space is actually nothing else than a, a, a sequence space with entries in, in the Fox space. So every one of these, every one of these true poly Fox spaces, there are isometrically isomorphic to, to, this, um, to the standard Fox space. So you have a, an infinite sum here of the same uh, Fox space. So we can write this as a, as a sequence space of Fox spaces with, with the standard sequence, um, um, like square summable sequences here. Okay, and that will, will be important later on. So keep, keep that in mind. And now these, um, these creation and annihilation operators can now be extended to an operator operator on all of L2, right? Um, like if, if you just take this A dagger and A up here, of course, they are not bounded. But with this additional factor here, uh, you can make this bounded and actually unitary operator on all of L2. So this FK here is just the kth component of F. You see, I, I decompose. A an L2 function here into its, its components. So you have uh, F1, F2, and so on. And well, that's this FK. And on these, I can apply my creation or annihilation operators and they're isometric on this space. And if I sum that all up, I get an, um, an, an unitary, op not a unitary operator, but a, a nice isometry on, on my L2 space. And if you think of this as, as, as the sequence space, then um, these are just shifts, right? You just shift uh, forward or forwards or backwards, right? So if you think of your L2 as just, just as the one-sided infinite sequence, in every entry you have a, uh, um, an analytic function, and then these just shift up by one to the right or one to the left, okay? And now, if we have these, of course, we can take an operator, want to know is it compact or not. We can just 
go back to our Fox space where we know a characterization of compactness, right? So we have, we, we take a bounded linear operator on this a true polyfox space. We know via this, these creation and elevation operators, we can just move it to the standard Fox space here. And well, compactness, of course, because these are unitarily equivalent if one is compact and the other is compact as well. Okay. And well, as I said, on, on the standard Fox space, we know how to characterize compactness uh, by the bauer is relowitz theorem. Um, just, to, just to recall, it says that an operator on, on the standard Fox space is compact if and only if it's in the tuplets algebra and generated by all functions with bounded symbol on the standard Fox space. And the Bayesian transform of T must vanish at infinity. So here you take, um, as I said earlier, if there is no, no K or no N here, then that's just the standard ones from the analytic Fox space. So you take the standard um, normalized reproducing kernels here, you put them together with a T, and if it vanishes at infinity, um, and the operator is in the tuplets algebra, then, then it's compact and vice versa. Okay, so now of course we could cheat a little bit and say, well, okay, we can just use the theorem because we're unitary equivalent here. So we, we get immediately this corollary. Okay, um, we just plug that in and see, okay, we must, we must have that this, this shifted operator, let's say, is, is in the Chaplitz algebra and the Bayesian transform of this shifted operator vanishes at infinity. Okay, as I said, it's a little bit cheated because we just move everything back to, to the standard Fox space. And it's, it's not really so helpful, right? Because now if you have a tuplets operator, T, let's say for T, we take some tuplets operator with some bounded symbol, then, well, how do I know that this is actually in the tuplets algebra, right? That's, uh, that's, that's not so easy to tell um, just, just from that. And well, we also don't really know what this Bayesian transform thing is. Okay. Now there is one theory. Yes. Rafael, one question, please. Well, yes. if you if you consider if you consider a topless operator with bounded symbol, an infinity symbol in a true polyfox space, you would like to move it down to the Fox space. Uh, then you need to, to do some differenti differentiations. And how do you know that you will have again? A normal L infinite function. It might, it might be something you very don't. strange object. Yes, you don't. You don't. That's actually yeah. this theorem here of yours. Yes, you, you actually don't know, but we'll come back to that. That's why I said this is a little bit cheated because you don't, don't actually know whether yeah. this is in, in the tuplets algebra, right? Um, so that's exactly the problem. Yeah. So exactly what, uh, what uh, Nikolai uh, was talking about. Um, so in uh, theorem with uh, Grigory, they showed that um, if you have such a tuplets operator on this true polyfox space, then this is actually unitary equivalent to some tuplets operator on the standard fox space, but the symbol may be very bad, okay? Because um, when you do that, you may need to take derivatives of functions that don't have derivatives. And so you don't actually uh, know if you get another function here. So you know you get some tuplets operator, but maybe with a very bad symbol. And so you don't actually know if this, if this um, tuplets operator you get is in the tuplets algebra, right? It sounds a little bit stupid to say, you don't know if the tuplets operator is in the tuplets algebra, but notice this is the tuplets algebra generated by bounded functions. If you have tuplets operator with a different symbol, even if the, if the operator is bounded, you don't know if it's actually in the tuplets algebra. And there are examples of tuplets operators with unbounded symbol that produce um, a, um, a bounded tuplets operator that is not in the tuplets algebra. So that doesn't actually help you very much. You still don't know if when you start with the tuplets operator, whether you land here in the tuplets algebra. And that's that's actually exactly the point we want to, want to talk about now. So what we need for this are the so-called band dominated operators. First, let me tell you what a band operator is. So take any, any bounded linear operator on the L2, and we say this is a band operator 
if there is some omega positive such that if you multiply from the left with the characteristic function of some set k and from the left some characteristic function um, of the set k k prime if this is zero whenever the distance between the two sets is larger than, than omega okay so that means if if k and k prime are sufficiently far apart then you want that if you take this product that you always get zero okay so it's, it's sort of a um sort of a finite information transport right so so you start at somewhere and you go to the other place and if you're far um if um if you're far enough apart then no information arrive, um, arrives at the other on the other side okay and we call it band dominated if it's uh, the limit of a sequence of band operators in the operator norm topology so and this is the picture you should have in mind and this is also why it's called a band operator and band dominated operators so um, think of an integral operator and take its kernel okay and you make a picture of its kernel and whenever an ent uh, whenever a value at some point is non-zero you put a black dot and if it's zero you put a white dot and then your band operators will look like this okay so there will be some sharp boundary and outside there there will only be zeros it will look like this and well if you take norm limits of these kind of things then it will look something like this so the the entries or the i should say the, the values will decay as you go off the diagonal yeah but there's no sharp boundary from which on everything is zero but if you go off uh, you get less and um, your values drop off in, in some in a certain speed of course um, but in, in some sense they drop off at uh, to zero as you go off the diagonal okay Th that's the idea that's the picture you should have in mind of these of these uh, operators okay now notice that we defined them on on l2 right you cannot do that on the polyfox basis directly because then you get no band operators you cannot you cannot have something like that you cannot have sharp you cannot sh uh, have these sharp cutoffs for polyanalytic functions okay so and this wouldn't work on the polyfox space directly but you can of course do this on l2 and then just take the compressions okay so you, you... Raphael, one question please Raphael. yes uh, question is it equivalent that you have a band dominated operator if and only if it commutes with multiplication by continuous function operator up to a compact operator? That's a very good question. Uh, I I'm not sure. Um, especially in this case, I'm not because sure. Because basi basically, that means that means that you have a some way to localize them yes it it's certainly related uh, but i'm not a hundred percent sure if it's the same okay okay so so now as i said we take these uh, compressions so you take any bound dominated operator you restrict it to the polyfox space and project it back onto the polyfox space and these i will be calling bdo with the subscript um, bracket k and and now it's not difficult to show that these are actually c star algebras right so if you if you add or multiply two bound operators it's relatively clear that you get a um, a bound operator again and then you take the closure so you get get a star algebra that's not so surprising and also if you take compressions this will also be um, a c star algebra um and it's also not so difficult to show that these both of these actually contain all compact operators. So BDO contains all compact operators on L2, and BDOK uh, contains all compact operators on, on the true polyfox space. And well, uh, I think it's obvious that um, BDO contains all multiplication operators, right? If you take any omega here larger than zero, then this here will always be zero. Right, because just everything commutes, and then if they have positive, these two sets have positive distances, will just be 
equal to zero. So multiplication operators are in BDO and so are the projections. That's, that's not so straightforward. So we have to actually do a computation, but the reason for that is that, well, you have these, um, you have these um, kernels. So these are integral operators. So you have these kernels and then you can check that the, the decay of, of the kernel of the, of the diagonal goes to zero um, sufficiently fast. So um, you have to make a direct computation to show that these are actually also band dominated. Okay. And well, that means that when we have multiplication operators in there, projections in there, that means we have the whole tuplets algebra in there, right? Because uh, everything we can, everything in the tuplets algebra is some combination of projection and, uh, and multiplication. So you will get the whole tuplets algebra in there. Okay, now um, we want to show that, or not show, but I want to um, convince you that these operators, so A times P, K, that these are also band dominated. So again, just like for the PK itself, you look at you look at a kernel. Of course, there is some um, e to the minus uh, w squared here as well from from the measure, and so you see also you drop off actually exponentially as you go off the the main diagonal. So with with a, with the very same argument as for the projections, you get that these this product is actually also band dominated. And then of course, similarly also for, for the adjoint. So this is C star algebra, so it's closed on adjoints. And this, this here is the adjoint of, of the other one. So these are contained in BDO, which means now that actually these BDO algebras, they're also all isomorphic, okay? So you just um, take an operator in BDOK, you apply these as earlier, as we did earlier, you, you apply these, these shifts, you get some operator on the standard Fox space and you will just land in BDO because everything, everything is, in, is in BDO. So you map one algebra to the other algebra and, and vice versa. And this, this is also um, isometric. So you get really a C star isomorphism here between, between these two C star algebras. Okay, so on, on, on the algebra level, all of this is actually the same. And well, this right-hand side, we actually know there's a result by Bauer and Fulcher. They showed that this video one is actually nothing else than the tuplets algebra itself. Okay, so this, this right-hand side is just, just the tuplets algebra generated by all bounded symbols. So, um, what we have now, so that's um, the result from the result from earlier. Now we can replace this just by T in BDOK, right? Because um, this this right hand side here is just BDO one, and now if you if you have these shift operators, this just means the T is in BDOK, okay? And this is this is a condition you can check, right? It's it's this condition that the kernel goes off when you go off the diagonal. Yes, please. Rafael, can you return to previous? Here or what, or this? Uh, no, not the previous. Uh, yes, uh, the, to the bauer fuser theory. Yes. Uh, if BDO one is exactly top of separator algebra, but uh, each element of this algebra is Commute with multiplication by continuous bounded continuous function. Well, maybe some behavior infinity up to a convex sum. Uh, does it shed some light for the question I asked you before? Whether or not mm -hmm. these bounded dominated operators are exactly those that commute uh, with continuous function with some maybe behavior at infinity model compact operator. Um. I don't think I can answer this right now. I have to think about uh, this question. Um, okay. I, 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 I don't know. I'll, I'll have to think about this. Yeah, because the Joplin separator algebra is very good for these things. For com, uh, yeah. For yeah, yeah, I, I know it's yeah. I, I, 
Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know it's, I know it's related, but I'm, not, I'm not sure. I sure, uh, right, not sure right now whether it's really the same. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry, sorry about it. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Okay, so let's continue. So we have, we have this. So this is now a jackpot condition. Also, um, it means that um, we don't have, for tablets operators we don't have to check anymore because we know this BDOK contains all tablets operators. So if you're just interested in tablets operators, this is for free. Okay. Now let's think about this Barrison transform of this. Um, I just put the definition back down here, and now of course this um, a dagger to the power of k times uh, this normalized reproduction kernel you can just compute, right? So this is some 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 differential operator you apply to to this kz and you get this this function here. So you might as well just write it like this, and then you get you, you well let's call this a Barrison type transform. Notice this is not the Barrison transform from earlier, right? So these these L, LZKs, these are not the normalized reproducing kernels on the a true polyfox space. Okay, these are different functions. But if you use these functions instead of, of the normalized reproducing kernels, then this works, right? Then that's exactly what, what we've shown here. So um, we can replace this by this. Um, Barrison type transform, which is not the usual Barrison transform. Okay, and so if you're now thinking of tuplets operators, um, you get, as I said earlier, this uh, simple result, which very, looks very much like in, in the standard Fox based case. You get tuplets operator is compact if and only if this, um, this inner product goes to zero as Z goes, not to zero, sorry, to infinity. This should be infinity here, right? So in, 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 this, in the standard fox based case, you have to reproduce the kernel here. The, now you need to, uh, to take these other functions here. So for this, this to work, but um, the spirit of the, of the result is exactly the same. And what you can now do with these is, for example, show that if, if the tuplets operator on the standard Fox space is compact, then every one of these is compact as well. So for every K. So in fact, it's like that. So if TF1 is compact, then TF2 is compact. If TF2 is compact, then TF3 is compact, and so on. So um, you get this whole chain of uh, implications like this. And you, the way you prove that is just you take, you take these functions and um, and compare them basically, right? And then you show, okay, for if it goes to zero for one, it goes to zero for two. If it goes to zero to two, to zero for two, it goes for three, and so on. Okay, kind of an induction argument. Okay, um, now before we talk about Hunkel operators, um, let me give you also some related result. Of course, if you're if we're talking about compactness, maybe the next question is, what about fretholmness? Maybe if we have a very good symbol, can we compute the essential spectrum? Maybe, okay? And for this, we do a little detour um, to answer this question. So let's define the Weil operators. These are the same that you would define on, on the standard Fox space. You can define them on L2 actually. And it's easy to see that these are unitary and you can compute the adjoint that's just the W minus C. I'm sure you probably know. Um, they also behave very well with respect to our um, creation and annihilation operators. In fact, they just commute with them. And um, they also commute with projections. So instead of considering them on L2, we could also consider them as a map from the true polyfox space to the true polyfox space. Okay, so they are the, the true polyfox spaces are invariant under these vial operators. Okay, and what we're now going to do is we're going to shift our operators, so take a bounded linear operator on our polyfox space, and we consider um, all the shifts we can get. So for every C, we consider this shifted version of T. So we put WC in the front and W minus C in the back and, sh and shift this. And the idea is, of course, 
that we shift that in some sense to infinity because always these these properties compactness we've already seen but also fretfulness usually has something to do with what happens at infinity so we want to shift this to infinity and in fact as one can show is that if we take up <clears throat> excuse me if we take an operator in video k then this extends to a strongly continuous map on the stone chesh compact indication so that's the maximal ideal space of bounded continuous functions so this is a strongly continuous map. And if we're in, in BDO, then we can actually extend it to, to this stone jesh boundary, you know, this massive, massive boundary of, of the complex plane. Okay. And another way of thinking about this is, is like this, that we take limits of this thing as Z goes to some boundary point. Notice this here is, is a, is um, a limit in terms of nets, right? So this really means we have an X on the boundary, then we take a net, um, the complex plane converging to that X. We actually need to take nets because um, you actually just don't change compactification does not allow sequences to reach the boundary. So um, we need to take nets, but the, the value does not depend on the net you take. So that's why we use this sort of abuse of notation Z goes to X, but it's it's in the net sense. Rafael, it's called yes. it's called the limit operator in the series, yes? Yes, this TX is this then called TX. the limit operator. Yes. 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 Okay. And now there's a general theory on, on limit operators. Um that that um, applies to many many cases and also applies to these cases. So there are there are a number of assumptions you have to check for whatever you're dealing with, whatever space you're dealing with, and um, you can in this case you can easily check. In fact, there's only one condition you really need to do something. All others are trivial. Um, you have this black box theorem that tells you when an operator is compact and when an operator is Fredholm in terms of these limit operators. So. Um, this gives, for example, another characterization of compactness. It says T is compact if and only if it's in this BDO and all limit operators are zero. And if you have a BDO operator, then T is Fretholm if and only if all limit operators are invertible. And of course, in that case, you can just write the essential spectrum as union of spectra of limit operators. So this is a very, very general theorem that applies to many, many cases, not, not just this one. Um, so so we, we, we have this. Now, of course, the problem with this formula is always that, well, it's difficult to, um, to actually compute the right-hand side unless your limit operators are very nice. Of course, if you're compact, well, then your limit operators are very, very nice, then they are all zero. So of course your essential spectrum will just be zero. But of course we know that already. But in general, it's very nice if the limit operators are actually just constants. If they're just constant multiples of the identity, well, we, then we know what the spectrum is and we get more um, explicit results in terms of um, like explicit values instead of just this union of, of Z, okay? And this is um, what you're going to investigate now. So for, for um, bounded continuous functions, we define the oscillation at a point Z, just as the maximum value, it can vary within this ball of uh, radius one, okay? And then the set of vanishing oscillation functions are just those functions for which the oscillation goes to zero. Um, at, at infinity, okay? I'm sure you've seen this notion before as well, okay? And then uh, what can be shown is that this, this best case scenario, right? This, that the limit operators are just constants um, happens if and only if your operator is actually a tuplets operator with vanishing oscillation symbol plus something compact, okay? So, this case happens if and only if um, we have a tuplets operator with vanishing oscillation symbol plus maybe something compact. And in fact, we, we can recover this F 
we actually know what this F is. F is just this, this generalized Berezin type uh, transform. Okay, so here this generalized Berezin type transform appears again. Not the standard Berezin transform you would maybe expect, but this generalized uh, function. And well, then for the essential spectrum, we just have to put in the values. Um, so you just get the boundary values of the Berezin transform as your essential spectrum in this case. Raphael, may I have a question here? Sure. Uh, is it correct to say that in this case, you can uh, substitute stone check compactification by compact of maximal ideals of your, of your VO space? Yes, that's true. Yes. So you need not, you need not to consider all stone check compactification? No, no. Even in general, you don't need actually stone check compactification, but you can use the Samuel compactification instead. Um, but I prefer stone chase just because it's easier to do things with it. But it's just a matter of preference. Yeah. yeah, but in this case, it would be just compact of maximal ideals or view minus minus C. Yes, yes exactly. Yes, exactly. Okay. And so this, this um, bears and transform evaluate at the boundary you can also write in a more classical way by saying this is intersection of all these um, all these uh, planes with holes, right? You make the hole bigger and bigger and you take the intersection and what's left is, is the boundary values. Right, okay. Now let's talk about Hunkel operators. So uh, let me recall, these are Hunkel operators and well, we know when an operator on, on the polyfox space is compact, that's the theorem from earlier, but well, we cannot apply this directly, right? Because this is for operators from the true polyfox space to the true polyfox space. So we cannot apply this directly, but of course you may say, well, we can consider this, right? We can, we can consider this. This is now an operator from the true polyfox space to itself. And well, this is compact if and only if the, the Hunkel operator is compact, right? That's, that's equivalent. So you could just apply this theorem to this product and, and you're good to go, okay? We could do that, but then the talk would be over. So, and we still have a few minutes. So um, I, I'll want to do this a little bit more general and get a little bit more general result. Okay, so, but, but this is perfectly fine. You can, you get a result like that. Anyway, well, what I want to come back to is this decomposition, right? Recall from earlier, we said all these true polyfox spaces, they're actually the same. And so the whole L2 space is nothing else than a sequence space. What's, what is an operator on a sequence space? Well, it's just an infinite matrix, right? An operator on a sequence space is an infinite matrix. So we can now interpret any operator on this L2 as an infinite matrix and every entry is actually an operator on the standard Fox space again. Okay, we can think of um, operators in this maybe complicated way, but it will be useful for this here. And then you can consider diagonal operators. Okay, if you have a bounded sequence of operators um, on, on your Fox space, then these act on this sequence space just by, by multiplication, right? So you have your sequence of analytic functions and to every entry, you multiply with some other um, a bounded linear operator, okay? Like, like this, so it looks like a multiplication operator, but um, be careful, this is actually non-commutative, right? So this is, this, uh, this is actually in, um, so if you think of, of infinite matrix, this is a diagonal matrix. And in every, on every diagonal entry, you have actually an operator on, um, on your uh, box space. And then, well, it's, it's a sequence space, so we can consider shifts. That's just the standard shift. And now let's consider operators of this form. Now, this notation is maybe a little bit unfortunate because we had band operators and band dominated operators before, but this is not the same. 
It's again called band operators and band dominated operators, but it's, it's really not the same notion. This is now matrix theory. And we want to use the matrix theory here. And so we have to define these band operators and band dominated operators again, but they are a little bit different. Okay, so in order to not confuse them, I always I will always write on little l2, which means I'm using this definition, which is not the same as the as the other one. Okay, so um, if we can write it as such a finite combination of diagonal operators and shifts, then this is a band operator and norm limits of them are called band dominated. So again, you should have this in mind. Now think of infinite matrices. Okay, it's the same picture as before, um, but now think of infinite matrices. Okay, this is now an infinite matrix and you have some entries. Every black point is an entry, which is itself a bounded linear operator on the Fox space. Okay, and why is this just zero? Okay, and so a bound operator will look like this. So it will be a matrix, which has like a band matrix, right? And um, well, band dominated, again, um, you will um, go to zero as you go off the, the main diagonal. So again, that's, that's the right picture to have in mind, but don't confuse it with the other notion. Okay, so let's now look at this uh, isomorphism between these two uh, spaces and see what we get for different operators. So let's, let's consider this Pn. Now notice there are no brackets. So this is the, the orthogonal projection on the full polyfox space of order at most n. Okay, if you do, um, if you transform this from one space to the other, you just get the orthogonal projection onto, onto a, um, um, well, on, on, on the space which only has n non-zero um, entries in your sequence, right? So um, if you think of it as a matrix, you will get you, this will be diagonal and you will have at the identity for the first, for the first n um, entries on the diagonal and then zero everywhere else and off the diagonal also zero, okay? That's how this matrix would look. Then you, we have the shifts. If this, this uh, forward shift V as a matrix, this looks like, well, on the first sub diagonal, you only have, have the identity and zero everywhere else. And if you transform this creation operator from one to the other, you get this shift operator. That's why I earlier called them already shift operators. Right? So, and there you have this 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 correspondence. Then how does your how does your tuplets operator look like in this picture? Well, um, for tuplets operator, you will just get an infinite matrix that only has one entry, only one entry at k k, and there it's exactly the tuplets operator. Everything else is zero. Okay. And for your Hunkel operator, you get a little bit more. For your Hunkel operator, you get a whole column that may be non-zero. And well, at KK, you have zero. That there where your tuplets operator lives, there you have zero for the Hunkel operator. And everywhere else in the column, you may have some, some operators in there. But all other columns are also zero. Okay, that's, that's another way of um, thinking, thinking about these operators. If you transform them from, from the L2 space, to, to the sequence space in this matrix picture. And, excuse me, why am I telling you this? Well, because now we can use the matrix theory. Well, because we, from the matrix theory, we know when such an operator is compact, right? So when we have a compact operator, so a compact matrix with operator entries, well, then necessarily every entry needs to be compact. That's, that's clear, right? So we have a comp this infinite matrix with uh, operator entries. This can only be compact if all entries are compact as well. Okay, so that's where this T in BDO, that's the first BDO we introduced today and this shift condition comes from. And then the other two condition, these are the matrix conditions, right? So we need that, 
um, as a matrix, this is band dominated on the sequence space and this norm limit goes to zero. So what you do here is you take your, you take your operator, so your matrix and you shift it along the diagonal and this needs to go to zero, okay? And then you can show exactly using this matrix theory that you need these four conditions. So you need for compactness, you need BDO, you need band dominated as a matrix. Again, they're different. Then you need this condition, which is rather condition the entries. And you need this uh, matrix shift condition um, in order to be compact, okay? Now this works for all operators in L2. In particular, we can now apply this to, to Hunkel operators, or um, let's make it a little bit more general first. So actually, if, if you have operators that satisfy this or the other way around, right? Of course, a Hunkel operator satisfies, uh, satisfies one of them. Let's see, satisfies the first one. Well, yeah, the first one when N is bigger than K, then your Hunkel operator, your, this norm will just be zero. So it satisfies the first one. Um, well, but yeah, okay. What I'm trying to say is if you have such an operator, then you can forget about the, the matrix stuff, right? These are then satisfied automatically. And then you just, you get, you're left with your conditions on the entries. So, and you will get T is compact if and only if T is band dominated and this um, shift, uh, this shifted operator goes to zero this um, as um, Z goes to infinity, or in other words, all limit operators are zero. Okay, and now we can apply this to Hunkel operators. As I said, Hunkel operators satisfy this. Um, so we get this. Um, Hunkel operators are in, in BDO um, because, well, projections are, multiplication are, so this is again automatically satisfied. So um, you just get this limit operator type condition. And then from this, um, you can also get uh, a VMO type condition, this standard uh, standard condition. Um, I didn't really talk much much about this, about this uh, function space theory, but this is also something you get. And um, yeah, by VMO, I just mean uh, functions for which this difference goes to zero as, as we go to infinity, okay? And, but most importantly here, um, what you see here is that this actually does not depend on K. Right? So the first two conditions seemingly depend on K. You have a K here, but the third does not. So this means if you have some, bound, some bounded symbol, then Hunkel operator on a two polyfox space is compact on all of them or on none, right? If it's compact on one, it's already compact on all others. Okay, because the third condition is independent of K. And what it also tells you is the, that you have this kind of result that um, the Hunkel operator is compact if and only if the, the Hunkel operator with the complex conjugate symbol is compact. That's just because the third condition is invariant under taking conjugates. So you get this result for free as well. Uh, yeah, that's, that's it for today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rafael. Very interesting, very nice talk. Please Thank questions, you. comments, suggestions, whatever you like. Well, I, I have many. Igor, I cannot believe. Oh, oh yes. I have many technical questions. Yes, but... Igor, please. I have many technical questions. But... Um... Uh, in in the last page, uh, mu is the Gaussian measure, yeah. The last page, uh, mu is uh, which the page measure, now? Yeah. Uh, in this page, for which example. Page, no? uh, yeah, uh, it, it's, it's always the Gaussian page. measure, yes. Uh, it's always the Gaussian measure, yes. Uh, very well. Uh, could you please show the definition of the modified uh, Bayesian transform? The of the modified, yes. Let me see if uh, I can find it. Yes. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, yeah. Here it is. Here it is. Yeah, exactly. So, um, 
Well, uh, this uh, factor uh, is um, uh, something similar to the main uh, term of the uh, of the Laguerre polynomial evaluated uh, in the in the difference. So it is similar to the main uh, summand main term of the um, of the true polyanalytic kernel. Yes. That's true. Yes. But it's not the full one, it's just the uh, first term. So it, it is not equivalent. No, it's it, it's not it's not the same now. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, in the last theorems, last theorems, for example, uh, uh, the previous one. This one? Uh, this one, yeah. So you have four conditions. Uh, T belongs to the uh, bind dominated operators. It is bind dominated in the metric sense. The shifted operators uh, go to zero at infinity, and this um, complicated condition. Bit. <clears throat> yes. In, in the in matrix form yeah. so uh, do you have examples when the first and the fourth uh, conditions are not uh, enough um, just video and uh, 10 to 0 at infinity um, just you want you want just video and uh, just nice conditions just nice conditions and omit uh com complicated conditions do we have uh, counter examples uh, uh, yes uh, i mean you just take um make make it diagonal make a diagonal matrix and put something on the diagonal like put something compact on on the diagonal so for each diagonal entry put something compact but so that the norm limit does not uh, converge to zero oh then um, yeah so it can it one and three but be, not yet. it yeah. could be a compact uh, on each true and true polynomial space but it will be not compact on the whole l2 yes exactly oh thank you yes you may take say uh, uh, rank one pres rank one operator in each polyfox two polyfox space but summing them up, you will have something not so good. Yes. Oh, see, yes. But uh, uh, will we uh, satisfy uh, these conditions, condition that it tends, tends to zero at infinity? Uh, sorry, what do you want? Uh, if you take the example proposed by, by Nikolai. Yes. Uh, uh, rank one, uh, rank one uh, operator on each true polyfox space. Yes. On each true polyfox space. Will it satisfy this condition? Um, let's see. Uh, Yes, it will. Yes, it will. It will satisfy this, but yes, not the fourth yes, condition. It will. it will satisfy this, but not the fourth condition. Okay. okay. Uh, more questions or remarks, suggestions? More ideas, Rafael? So I have a question. Um, this mm -hmm. is Wolfram. Hi. Oh, hi, Rafael. Um, so it seems that. Oh, hi, Wolfram. Are you here? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Hello to everyone. Uh, it seems that several of the properties you've proved are independent of K, like the compactness. Um, so is, mm -hmm. is the same true maybe for the spectrum of a, or essential spectrum of a tuplice operator? Um, and how about the boundedness of a tuplice operator if you have an unbounded symbol? Mm. Can you say anything about that? Uh, I didn't think about unbounded symbol as a, at all, so I can't say anything about um, the, uh, the about 
the boundedness, now the spectrum. Uh, let me think. Do you have a counterexample? Uh, I think, um, well, not exactly what you want, but I think we can have a counterexample for a triplets operator. Let, let's see. Um, where is the other theorem? Here, so here we have this corollary that TF1 is compact, then every other um, TFK is also compact. The other direction is not true. So um, you can have that the essential spectra are different. Now about the spectrum, I'm not so sure, but I assume it, it also will not be uh, the same always. Mm -hmm. Even for VO symbols, where you have some explicit, um, more explicit uh, form of the essential spectrum with the Peresian transforms? Yeah. Um, here. Um, yes, I think, yeah, I think this will even be a VO symbol. Yes, I think so. Uh, I'm not 100% sure, but I would think we could construct something like that, yeah. I see, that is interesting. So not everything is invariant. <laughs> no. Okay, thanks. More questions? Well, if not, let us thank Rafael for a very interesting talk. And I have a personal question to Wolfram. Wolfram, are you ready to give a talk at our seminar? Um, it depends when. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would say, it, first of all, it, each Wednesday. And maybe we can plan it to, for the beginning of December. Yeah, the beginning of December should probably work or the middle of December, but um, um, I may travel one week. So maybe we can discuss, okay. we can discuss through email. Yeah, sure, sure. So we are thinking about your talk sometime in the first part of the set or okay, before sure, Christmas. Yeah, yeah. so th thanks for, for invitation. Yeah. It will be my pleasure. <laughs> yeah. Okay, again, thanks for accepting it. Okay, so thank you very much for all. We have today 20 participants. It's very good. So nice. best wishes to all of you, take care. And uh, our next seminar will be next Wednesday and Maribel uh, Ar Armando will talk. Yes, he is the, uh, he is speaking next week, yes. Armando Sanchez Nungaray. He is speaking next week, Armando Sanchez Nungaray. Okay. Mm -hmm.